now with literally over the course of these years 50 million people, 4 million people in live seminars over a period now of 34 years. And at this point, I'd have to be an idiot not to see there are patterns in human behavior around the world. That while all of us are totally unique as human beings, there are certain things that cause us to succeed and certain things that cause us to fail. There are certain things that will make you miserable in the middle of good times, and there are things that will make you feel extraordinary even when times are extremely tough. And once you know what those patterns are, and you learn how to take control of them, your whole life can change. I don't know if you've never met me before, you might think I'm Mr. Positive Thinking. I'm not. I'm not here today to come pump you up and say, go to your garden and chant, there's no weeds, there's no weeds, there's no weeds. I'm here to say, bullshit, there's weeds, let me show you where they are and let's pull them out. I'm very pragmatic about what does it take to make life work. But what I want you to know is, Australia, of all the places on the face of the earth, when I was talking to my client, he was saying, Tony, of all the places on earth, there's one place you'd pick to have a great quality of life with your family that will weather the storm the best, it's Australia, by far. You guys are in the best place on earth to make it through this situation and take advantage of it. But the real secret is, whether you suffer or whether you succeed is not gonna be based on the season. Some people freeze to death in the middle of the winter. Other people ski and snowboard. It really comes down to what are you gonna do? So as I was coming here, I was thinking, what can I do to show you how to take advantage of the season? What can I do to show you how you can absolutely, it doesn't matter what the season is, is a bad season financially a good or bad time to start a business? Tell me, which one? When the economy is toughest, is it a good or bad time to start a business? You tell me. Which one? You go, well, of course, that's what he expects me to say is good. But it's the truth. If you look at the Fortune 1000 companies around the world, 65% of them were started in a depression or a recession. The reason is they were started with somebody when all the competition was freaking out, somebody could start like Apple computers in the middle of a recession with selling their Volkswagen bus and coming out with some ideas because everybody else was scared and wasn't willing to do whatever it took. Disney started in the depression, right? Fortune magazine started in depression. How are you gonna build your fortune in the middle of a depression? It's why they're one of the strongest companies in the magazine business and a business that's pretty horrible for most people. If you look at Microsoft, it was a recession. You look at the best and most powerful companies, it's because they understood something that's really critical, and that is, don't ask it be easier, ask and make yourself better. If you get strong during the tough time, you'll dominate for the rest of your life. But what I think would be useful is maybe walk you through a, a tool that I've got that I've developed over the years to turn companies around. And the fundamental tool is there are areas of your business, every one of you in this room, no matter what your business is, if you're in business, you're probably doing something well. How many got some area of your business you're proud of, whether it be marketing or sales or the product or the service? How many got an area you're proud of? Say, I. How many got an area you're less than proud of? Say, I. The challenge is, where does our energy go? To the areas we feel most skilled and powerful in or least skilled and least powerful in? Which one? Now, our energy tends to go to the areas we feel most powerful. We do what makes us feel good. We do what we feel competent in not what we feel incompetent in. And business is complex. It doesn't have to be, but it is. So I thought maybe there'd be a format I could give you there is, let's walk through what the business environment's really like right now, and then let's see if we can walk through what are the areas that if you were just to do this, if I never saw you again, and my goal is to see you again, my goal is to add enough value, go, okay, this is no brainer. I'm gonna take four days when Tony comes back, I'm gonna go, go in this experience and be immersed and grow my business 30 to 100%. But if I don't, Here's what I want you to do, or if you don't. I'm gonna cover seven areas that are what I call the seven forces of your business. Each force has a forceful impact on your level of success or failure, profitability, et cetera. There's some areas I bet you're doing good in. Some areas you could do better in. Some areas you're very weak in. The problem is a chain is only as strong as its weak as what? And in business, so many businesses go through challenges because those weak links are the ones that destroy you, not your strengths. It's true around the world, but actually Australian business is interesting, a little bit more intense than even business in the US in one category. What percentage of Australian businesses are still alive five years after they start? Who knows? 
what percentage of Australian businesses are still alive five years after they start? I'll give you a clue. 90% of all Australian businesses are gone in the first five years. If you and I are going to really make this thing work, it's that we got to look and say, okay, why do businesses, why do they fail? Why do so many businesses fail? Why is it? I mean, good intention people, smart people, strong people, and yet they still fail. And many of them had good products, good services. They had great advantages when they start. They may have even been successful for three or four or five years or even 10 years. And now they're gone. I will tell you what I've seen in my life, and I've had the privilege now of working around the world with 50 million people through my books and tapes and audio and video programs, but I've worked with 4 million people, 4 million from 100 different countries over the last 34 years. I can clearly tell you there's patterns you don't miss when you've been with that many people and that many businesses. And the one pattern I can tell you above anything else is most businesses fail because they fail to anticipate what's coming. Write that down. Write down anticipation is the ultimate power. If you fail to anticipate, no matter how smart you are, you're going to end up reacting and your business will pay the price. And the price in the sport we're in is death, the death of the business, just like a gladiator. Now, what do I mean by this? Maybe I can, do, I can show you what I mean by giving you an example that more people can relate to. Um, I want you to sit up in your chair with some energy. So I know you're in it. Sit up in your chair with some energy. Make sure the person next to you has got some energy. And I want you to yell out, I, if this describes an experience you really have. And I want you to be honest. If, if it doesn't describe an experience you have, don't say anything. But if it describes an experience you have, I want you to raise your hand and go, I, all right? So here's my question. How many of you in this room have ever experienced the total and complete humiliation that comes when you play a video game against a child. How many have had this experience? Say I! How many have had this happen more than once? Say I! Who always wins when you play a video game against a child? Who? The child! Why? Is it because they're smarter, quicker, faster? In fact, don't even tell me why. Think about how the process occurs. First of all, you don't play many video games, so you're smart. You don't offer to be a part of this game. It usually occurs because one of your children, or you maybe have, you're an aunt or an uncle to someone, or a friend, and they say to you at Christmas time, auntie, unc, somebody, mom, dad, play this game with me. And you say, no, no, I don't play those games. You go enjoy it. I'm no good at it. And they go, no, no, it's really easy. Let me show you. And they hand you this little gun, they go, just choon, 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 bam, bam, bam. You just shoot guys just like that. It's so easy. And they go, come on, do this with me. And finally, you acquiesce. And then what happens? You should know you're being set up when they say, you go first. <laughs> and what happens? You pick up that gun, and these aliens come at you, choon, 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 and you're dead usually in about 3.8 seconds. Now the child takes the gun. What happens? In about 45 minutes later, you get your second turn. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say I. Now you're pissed, right? You're like getting competitive. I'm not getting shot in three seconds. So you, now you're really focused, and you get shot in the back, and you're dead in two seconds. The kids, 45 minutes later, you get your third one. The kid scores 480 million points. You get three. Who's had this experience? Say I. Why does the child always win? Is it because they're younger, faster, smarter, more flexible? Their minds are wired this way. No, listen to me. The child always wins because they played this game before. And because they played the game before, listen to me, key words, they know the road ahead. And if you know the road ahead, you have the ultimate advantage over everyone around you. You must know the road ahead. Why? Because when you know the road ahead, you can anticipate. Write it down again. Anticipation is the ultimate advantage in business and in life. 
Anticipation, when you know the road ahead, you know what's coming. When you know what's coming, you can anticipate. When you can anticipate, what's the benefit of anticipation? When you anticipate, you're ahead of the game. If you're not anticipating, what do you have to do? React. And when you're in the game of business and you react, you're gonna die. It's that simple. I don't care who you are, I don't care how long you've been in business, if you find yourself reacting, you're gonna die. You're in business and you didn't anticipate some of the challenges coming up with technology, and all of a sudden it eats you up in a week, in a month, what you built five, 10 years ago disappears. Who's seen this happen and knows what I'm talking about is real here? Say I. So we're talking about the most important skill of all here, anticipation, because otherwise you're reacting. Why does the kid succeed? They played it so many times, guess what they know when the game starts? First bad guy's here, second bad guy's here, third bad guy's here. They don't wait, they anticipate, and they take control. If there's one gift you could give yourself, it's to know this, write this down if you would. The biggest chokehold in any business the biggest chokehold in any business is always the owner slash leader. It's the owner leader's psychology or skills. The biggest chokehold in any business is the owner leader's psychology or skills. Your mindset, what eats you up is you don't know what's coming. You don't have the skill to handle what's coming because you don't know it. Or, you're so beat up psychologically, emotionally by what you've been through, you can't find the answer. So as a result, you end up with a story that limits you. You end up in a state that limits you. What's stopping the business, another way of saying this is, the story, the state, and the strategy of the owner or the leader. If you change that owner leader's state, story, and strategy, you change everything. If you don't, they're not gonna succeed. So Bill Gates, as a gutsy bastard. Bill Gates has a lot, of, I mean, the guy took big risks. He was at Harvard, had a great education set up, wasn't doing so good, but he read a magazine article about the first personal computer called the Altair. And as he read it, he said, you know what? I think this is the future. He anticipated the changes that would come in the future. But he had guts and he took a risk. That's why he's who he is. He called the guy up and he said, listen, I see you got this new computer. You guys need software for that. He said, I've written software for it that'll make it run perfectly. Was that true, yes or no? It's total bullshit. He made it up. He was just being gutsy and saying, if I tell the guy I've got software and he says, come see me, I'm gonna figure out how to do it. Pretty ballsy. Sure enough, the guy said, bring it to me in three weeks. So he had three weeks to come up with software between he and his partner. And he worked around the clock. And literally, when he went to Altair in New Mexico to show this software, he didn't have a computer to test it on. He didn't know if it was going to work for sure. Thank God for his future, it worked. It was a gutsy, risky thing. He invested all his time and energy. He blew off his school. He did everything. And thank God for him, it worked. But that didn't make him wealthy. You know what made him wealthy? Something called MS-DOS. MS-DOS was software that he did not write. He bought MS-DOS that made him three and a half billion dollars for $50,000. Bill Gates bought it for $50,000 from somebody else. He saw IBM and he was studying his competition. And he said, they think they're in the computer business and I think the computer business is gonna become a commodity at some point in the future. I want to control the intelligence that controls those computers. So what I'm going to do is I'll offer the software and I'll just go buy it from this kid over here. Now $50,000 is a huge sum of money. Most business people don't have guts, they don't take risks, and they don't invest. He said, I got to do this. Rolled the dice, got it locked up, went to IBM and convinced them. Now IBM wanted it. What did IBM want to do? They wanted to buy it from him. He said, no. I'll rent it to you. They said, no, no, no. He said, look, you're not in the software business anyway. You're in the computer business. You don't want software. Software changes. You don't know that area. Let me do this for you. The biggest strategic, remember I said your life is controlled by your what? Decisions. That decision made him wealthy. That decision for IBM made them a has-been in a short number of years. 
you have to anticipate the shifts. Am I making sense with you here, yes or no? So what's the solution? The solution, listen to me, is constant and never ending improvement on the areas that control the success or failure of your business. Constant, never ending improvement. It doesn't have to be huge, but it has to be constant. Incremental improvements in the areas that matter on a regular basis and you will dominate as long as you also anticipate. So let me give you seven real fast, because I'm on tight, tight, tight on time. Let me give you the first of the seven. Let me show you how it works. I'm gonna start with the end in mind. If you're gonna be successful in business, the end outcome, what makes somebody successful in business is not that they make a sale. If all you do is make a sale, you made a little money. To have a business, it has to be sustained. To be sustained, you have to build clients, or at a minimum, what I would call raving fan clients, raving fan customers. Now, why is the target of all business a raving fan customer? Well, first of all, what makes a human being wealthy in financial terms? What will make you wealthy is only one way to get wealthy and stay wealthy. Add more value to other people's lives than anyone else can possibly do. If you add more value than anybody else, you will have people be a raving fan of your product, service, or company. And raving fans are the best marketing in the world because today, nobody pays attention to advertising unless it's shocking. And even then, it doesn't necessarily sell the product. What sells products today is people telling people this is the best shit you can get. How many agree with me on this right now? Say I. And you can't buy that word of mouth. You can only deliver it by delivering such an incredibly valuable experience or product or service that people tell everybody about it. The first key to getting to that target, if we're gonna, like, we're, gonna, we're gonna grab hold of our energy and we're gonna race towards this target, is you have to do step number one. Step one in a business is you gotta know where you really are. You gotta know where you really are and you gotta build what I call a business map. Now what do I mean by a business map? Well, think of it this way. How many of you in this room have a five-year business plan right now for your company? Five-year business plan, raise your hand. Now, a group of you know, 9,000 people, I'm seeing maybe a dozen hands. The reason you're seeing a dozen hands is because even if you have to do a five-year plan, it's bullshit. And I'm not being disrespectful, it's bullshit. Why is it bullshit? Everyone tell me. Why is a five-year business plan in the world we live in today total bullshit, why? Because the world is changing so fast, you have no clue what's gonna be here in five years. You're kidding yourself. So what do you, throw up your hands and just hope it works out well? That's a disaster too. What you need is a business map. A business map means you understand the territory. You understand what's happening, where it's happening, so as you're moving along, you can adjust with that map to get where you wanna go as the environment changes. The way you frame what business you're in to yourself is the single biggest limit in your business, and I promise you it's limiting who you do business with as well. You know, if you, if you ask Peter Drucker, one of the greatest business geniuses of all time, he used to say, there's really only one question, maybe two in business. His question is, what business are you in, and how's business? You must control the meaning within yourself, within your team, and then the way you market it. But you can't do that until you're crystal clear what business you're in. And every seven weeks, you should be digging in deeper to what business you're in, or you'll ask a third question. What business do you need to be in? Because let me tell you something. You didn't experience in 2008 in Australia what the rest of the world did, but you're gonna experience some of what the rest of the world has experienced coming soon. You're gonna experience it in your real estate market, you're gonna experience it in your shares market, and you're gonna experience some unemployment on a much larger scale than what you guys are uncomfortable with right now. It's coming. I'm not here to be Mr. Positive and I'm not being negative. I'm saying it's coming, so you wanna take advantage of winter, not let it freeze you to death. And you can, because when everybody else is scared and hesitating, if you're doing the things I'm showing you, you will take their market share and you will dominate. Even if you're a little guy, you can become a big guy in this time. Because the time in which things change is tough times. That's when little guys become big guys. Because the big guys are doing the same boring shit over and over again and they're not flexible. But I gotta tell you something. In order to succeed in your business, you gotta fall in love with your clients and not with your products and services. But here's the other question. What stage 
of the life cycle of a business are you in? Listen to me. This understanding is the most important standing of all, and I can't give it to you all here. I take a day on this. When I say I give people a million dollar guarantee, the reason I'm given that million dollar guarantee and no one ever takes me up on it, I mean, I think two times in three years someone's taken me up on it, and when they did, I've been glad because I didn't want a stupid person in my seminar. I was like, if you can't see this gonna save you a million dollars and make you a million dollars, you shouldn't be in here, right? I'm happy to refund your money. Is this material, and this material is understanding the life stage of the business. See, businesses have life cycles just like humans do. So watch this for a second. Which can get into more trouble, an infant or a toddler? Quick, nice and loud, which one? Nice and loud, which one? Why? Because the toddler's more mobile. They can go, what does this rock taste like, right? Which one could get more in trouble, a toddler or a teenager? That's right. Tell me, if you give your car to a teenager and you say, drive it never above the speed limit, what can you promise and guarantee they're going to do? Are they going to speed, yes or no? And the worst thing that can happen is they get away with it. Let me explain what I mean. Businesses have stages of development. What do they tell you was the most important thing to business? The power of anticipation. What if there was a way to know in advance what problems you were gonna have in your business before they happened, you knew exactly what they were, how they were gonna happen, and what to do to prevent them right now, no matter what stage you're in. How many think that'd be might worth its weight in gold? Raise your right hand, say aye. aye. That's what happens when you understand the stage. Let's go to number two. The second key force of business that you gotta be working on is constant, constant strategic innovation. Now what the hell does that mean? Sounds so complex, strategic innovation. Notice I didn't just say innovate. You can innovate, 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 and it may not make a difference. And innovation takes time, energy, and money. It's gotta be innovation the customer cares about. Let's go back to Peter Drucker for a moment. Peter Drucker has always said that the core of all business is only two things. If a business is successful, these two things are its core, innovation and marketing. Everybody else in your company is employed by the people who innovate and market for your company. Because without them, there is no company. Now, what does innovation mean? It means finding a way to meet people's what? Needs. It means finding a way to add more what? Than anybody else is adding. But listen to me. And maybe this will help you understand innovation in a different way. People say, but I am meeting their needs. And my customers are really happy. So why innovate? because it's called innovate or die in the world we live in. Let me explain why. How often does Apple computer, even though they're the best, find a way to innovate again? How often can you count on it? Is it consistent, yes or no? Every year, sometimes multiple times in a year. Isn't it true? That's why they're number one. So what you have to do is you can't just meet your needs. You gotta meet their needs in a new way. Meet the needs even more. Add more value, but do it in a new way. That's how you have raving fan clients. It's not enough to meet their needs. It's not enough to add more value. Got to do it in new ways all the time. It, it makes it sexy. It makes it mysterious. It makes it interesting. It makes them want to engage you. It gets them to tell everybody else about the new thing you're doing. Okay? Now, let's go to number three real fast. I'm going to have to kick this in gear to catch up. So number three is... If you, what, what, what was it that we said, Drucker said? All business is two things, innovation and what? Come on guys, innovation and? Marketing. Answer this question for me. Does the best product or service always win, yes or no? Nice and loud, yes or no? Which company always wins? McDonald's? <laughs> Where does that shit come from? <laughs> No, the best marketed product or service, for better or worse. And let's use McDonald's, okay, ma'am? That's a good example. Tell me something. Perfect example. Does McDonald's make the best tasting hamburger in the world? Notice we got a universal 9,000 person response, no. Is it the tastiest, is it the best quality, yes or no? But it is the best what? Marketed, as you would say, marketed in the world. I call it marketed. The point of the matter is, this company understands marketing, and even though they have a shit product, they got billions and billions and billions of people to eat that shit. 
Now, here's the problem with marketing today, and it's a, it's a significant problem. I want you to think about this. Does anybody know how many marketing messages the average person had to see 15 years ago, how many messages before they would start to seek you out to consider buying your product, where they would do something active to seek out your product? Does anybody know? 15 years ago, how many times did they have to see a message from you on average if you had a quality ad? The answer is four. 15 years ago. Does anybody know what the number is today? 16. Now, what do you think that's done to companies' profitabilities? Add value. Does this make sense? Become an education marketer. Become someone that does value. Because then you become the valued expert, not a stupid salesperson. Because you're giving me something. And if you give me something, I, I want to give you something. I'd love to give you my business if you're going to give me something. But if you're just going to advertise, 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 screw you. Raise your hand if you follow on this. Say I. And then you don't have to go for 16 exposures. You can get somebody in one exposure. And they'll answer your emails. And they'll reach out to you. And you'll watch your business grow like you can't even dream. Force number four is the constant, never-ending improvement of sales and mastery systems. Sales mastery systems. Marketing is wonderful. But if you don't convert that marketing into sales, you don't have a business. Now, because of time, here's all I'll tell you on this one. We're going to give you that's valuable, that's simple. How about this? How many of you in the, right now in this room have a business that's primarily done with no salespeople all on the web? Raise your hand. No salespeople all automated. Raise your hand if you have salespeople, if you have salespeople that work with you, the majority of you. If you have an automated business, no matter how good it is, you don't want a one-legged stool. A one-legged stool at one point can get in trouble and you collapse. You want at least three legs, and one of those legs, as a minimum, has got to be a sales team. Now, how can you grow, though, when you're a brand new small business or you've been around a while? Well, technology today allows us to be able to hire people to go to work for us literally 24-7, 365 all around the world. We literally have more than 150 people that work for one of my companies, all of which live in different parts of the world, all of which we know only by way of our experience of them by way of Skype, calls where we can see them and coach them, but we measure them better than the persons in the same room with us in the old days. We know what they're doing every moment. We know people are responding. We know everything because it's all fed to us by the web. We have virtual companies now. So if you don't have a lot of resources, we can show you how to get three or five salespeople in your little company, like these couple of guys here that right now are operators. What if you had three people that their entire life was about how to make sure they filled your business. Well, you wouldn't have one little location, you might have five. But here's what I can tell all of you, just give you one quick hint in this area in the time that we got. Write down one thing. Great salespeople are not trained, they are found. Great salespeople are not trained, they are found and then trained to be even better. And this is coming from a guy that's trained two million salespeople in the world. I did that for 15 years. It's one of my jobs. Here's what I mean by this. Write down this phrase. Nature is the most powerful factor. Nature is the most powerful factor. If I was going to give you something in two seconds right now, I'd say it's this. If you're going to get a great person to sell for you, you can train somebody all day long, but their nature has to match the job. The fifth force you've got to take control of, you've got to have constant anticipation. Remember that key word, anticipation? So you're not reacting you're anticipating, you know the road ahead, in two areas of your business. Legal, and I know you're not a lawyer, at least most of you, but you gotta know where your risks are, and financial or accounting. Now, how many of you in this room as business owners hate accounting? If you're with me, brothers and sisters, can I have a hallelujah? <laughs> However, unfortunately, even though you hate it, how many of you in this room have ever been bitten in the bum, so to speak, because you thought the numbers were one thing or they meant something or your cash was one level and it was another. Some accounting piece that really, really hurt you at the time. Who's had this experience before? Raise your hand nice and high, say aye. I wanna tell you something. More companies go down because most of you in this room do not like accounting and I do not wanna sell you on being an accountant. What a boring ass job. But I do wanna sell you on knowing enough of this that you can run that accountant or that CFO.
because you still have to lead. And if you don't, you'll become part of the 99% that fail. I don't care how big, smart you are, I don't care how much your sales are. Learning how to manage your business includes the economics. And we take half a day and make it fun so that you can kick ass with any CFO or accountant and you can ask them questions they don't know. Let me ask you two questions real fast. Question one, how many of you have a specific day of the month that you always go through your financials and you never, ever miss on your business? Raise your hand. Keep your hand up and look around the room. It's not even 3% of the room that does this. That's why 99% go out of business. Remember I said in the beginning, what is the chokehold in the business? It's the psychology and the skills of the entrepreneur. If you don't develop the skill of knowing how to manage the finances, I don't mean write it down and do the accounting. I mean know how to read that and use that information as intelligence to guide yourself, you're gonna be in trouble. In business, nobody gets a special license. You can go out there and know nothing about numbers except what you think you know, and that's why you go out of business. This is a skill, if you don't get it from me, you better go get it now but I can give it to you in a fun way in half a day of the four days, where you'll be able to read financials and find stuff your accountant's not finding. And then what you wanna find is the intelligence that allows you to know how to run your business more effectively. I'll give you a little clue. Who here knows the three documents you've gotta see every single month to run your business? Raise your hand if you know the three and can name them. Look around the room, look at this. We got 9,000 people in this room, and maybe 20% of you even know the documents. You don't review them, you don't even know what they are. Here, I'll give you a little gift, something that took me 20 years to figure out. Little gift. If you got a business that has a 20% margin, margin of net profit, and most of you probably have a margin less than that, some of you maybe more than that. But if you have that, and you just cut 12% of your costs, 12% of your costs on a 20% mar margin company, you'll grow your profits by 50%, meaning you have a 30% margin. If you wanna, listen to me, you wanna grow your profits 50%, all you have to do is control, cut 12% of your costs. But you're never gonna do that when you don't even rate, look at your own financials. Let's go to the next one. Finally, number six. Number six is, what if I said to you there was treasure in your business, and that treasure is just waiting for you to come by and pick it up, but you gotta dig for it, but if you pick it up, it's gonna cost you nothing. What if I said to every one of you in this room, no bullshit, no hyperbole, no exaggeration. In the next six to 12 months, 18 months at the outside, in a tougher economy even, you could grow your business 30 to 130%, no exaggeration, no hyperbole. And it's not gonna cost you any more money to do it. When I say it's not cost you any money, let me be honest. You might find by spending $5,000, you could make 150,000. Or by spending 10, you could make half a million. So to me, that's not spending money. How many follow what I'm talking about here? Say I. That is this skill. This is my strongest skill. This is why companies call me in to do turnarounds. This is why my companies are where they are through all the economies and all the countries I've been in all the industries. You have to learn the skill of optimization and maximization. That's this point. You have to learn to optimize and maximize your business on an ongoing basis. Now, what does that mean? It means figuring out how to do what you're already doing where you get a geometric result from a bunch of small changes. Small changes that accumulate to create a geometric change. But you gotta master this. Go home and figure this out by itself if you want to and you can start making progress right away.